taking your time to join us today. I am happy to be talking today. Today, our meeting will take a little bit, uh, will look a little bit different from the usual, uh, because I'll basically be sharing from my experiences as a financial planner, some of the things I have learned uh, to be like basics or things we really need to have for us to manage any well. So if it's your first time to join us, uh, welcome. And um, we normally run these webinars every uh, second Thursday of the month. We have been doing this for a while since 2000. So uh, there's a lot you can catch up on in our YouTube channel. Steffi will put the details of our YouTube channel and you can go and find all the past recordings. So today I, 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 I found that there's a very big interest in this uh, topic. Um, the number of people who have registered is quite high, a little bit higher than what we've had in the past few meetings. And I hope that I'll be able to share my insights on the basics that I have found to be important for you to manage your money well. And like I said during the invitation, uh, this applies to everyone. It doesn't matter whether you're just about to start working or you have been at it for the longest, you're in retirement and you've managed a lot of your money, I believe everyone will get something. And uh, probably you'll also be able to share with someone else. So this is, uh, is mainly from my perspective. Um, for those who don't know much about me, uh, I'm, I'm a financial and retirement planner. I had a career in uh, the mainstream financial services industry as an insurance and retirement professional for 17 years. And during that period, I interacted with people of all ages and groups uh, as I helped individuals and organizations set up their retirement benefits plans. But one of the things I noticed is that many people were feeling ill-equipped at the point of retirement, uh, even having worked for a very long time. So I sought to leave and uh, come and help people with planning because I felt that products can only serve you to a, to a certain extent but you need to plan well to be able even to benefit from the financial plans that or financial products that are there. So in 2017, uh, I left and I started working with individuals and it's been a blessing to work with very, uh, very good clients. Let me call them very good clients. Uh, they've been very open to share their, um, their finances, their lives with me because I normally say with financial planning, we basically plan life we plan the things you want to do, and then we look at how we can fund that. So they tend, uh, they tend to let me in on a lot of what is going on in their lives and their finances. And out of all those things, I've been able to see some patterns. I've been able to learn a few things. And so today I'll be sharing from, from that perspective. So just in case you're wondering who are my clients, uh, my clients tend to be across all ages. Uh, I think my youngest client, the client I worked with, the youngest is here. Uh, his name is Big Dave. Then I think he was 23. I don't know how much, how old he is now. But I've also had a privilege to work with people in all age groups. And my oldest clients are in the 80s. I have two clients who are in their 80s, a number in the 70s. And a lot uh, of most of my clients are between 40 and 50s. But I've, I've, I've been able to benefit from both perspectives, what is important to the young people and as well as what is important to the older people. But one of the interesting things I have noted across all these um, five years is that what, what a, a 23 year old client knows and what an 80 year old client knows doesn't seem to vary much. That is in terms of technical knowledge of financial planning and financial products. A few clients here and there will be exposed to some products, but I have noticed that the knowledge base tends to remain the same. Many clients don't know about basic products like money markets, whether they are young or even where they are old. There are people who've, who've gone through their careers, they have retired, and we had conversations about such products at retirement. So with the exception of a few, many of them did not know. So the knowledge base doesn't seem to change much. So I realized there's a problem here. And to me, it looks like unless you actively do something about your knowledge and experience of financial planning, it doesn't matter if you grow in terms of career or in terms of education, it seems like that growth does not necessarily result into you managing your money well. So it is 
It is a deliberate effort to learn about managing finances. Experience doesn't seem to teach much because experience is quite limited to just what you're learning. So it might leave you unaware of a lot that is going on. So that is the first observation I found. But the next thing I also noticed is that all, most of us struggle with managing money. Very few people are very confident about their skill of managing money. Um, they know they don't know all that they need to know. And that was quite interesting. And what I came to realize is that we have some people who really needed to know a lot more, but you also had some people who knew a lot. And, and, and I would say a lot in terms of almost enough to do a good job. And many people are also doing a good job. Actually, I would say majority of my clients are already doing a good job, but the main struggle tends to be clarity and confidence. Being clear that you're on the right path or being clear that what you're doing is the right thing. And also having that confidence that I'll be able to achieve my goals. So that seems to be the main struggle with many people. Clear on what they need to do and confidence in what they are doing. Without those two, you'll tend to wonder. You'll tend to be on the right path, but because you're not sure, if you see other people doing other things, you are easily distracted and you veer off the right path. And some people have been able to find the right path. So clarity and confidence is a big deal. And so the other thing I've also realized is that as I interact with clients, especially the older ones, many of them are really concerned about their children. They are like, okay, I have made some financial mistakes. I don't think my children um, know what they need to know. How can I teach my children? Yet some of the children are already old enough. They're already independent, managing their money. And so this, they, they, they are wondering, will my children be okay? And they really want their children to, 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 to learn what they have learned. And, and some of them have actually introduced them to me and we are working with their children. So lack of confidence in the parents uh, in their own ability to manage finances sometimes will also translate in their doubt as to whether their children are ready to manage their finances. And the other thing that is important about this is that if, if you're not sure of what you know, or for example, if you don't know enough or what you need to know, you realize that even, even your best effort at passing that knowledge to your children, you'll not be passing what they need to know. You might pass wrong things as we will see, but you could also pass inadequate information. So it is important that we actually start with the parents. The parents need to gain this confidence. They need to know what they need to know. And then as they teach their children, then they'll have the confidence that the children are well equipped to actually manage their own money. And I'm a parent and I like, um, I always get fascinated at how excited as parents we are when our children take their first step. I mean, that's something uh, we celebrate, we're excited about it because it marks a transition from very, I mean, uh, children who do not work tend to be very dependent on their parents. They need to be moved around and all that. But the minute this child takes their first step and they're able to walk, we know that their journey to independence has started. And no parent wants to always be taking care of their children uh, unless uh, probably they are unwell and they really need to be taken care of. So I can use the same analogy when it comes to managing finances. If you don't teach your child to walk, then you might have to carry them along all their lives if they don't develop that ability to walk. And the same thing with finances. If we do not help our children or if our children don't run, learn this skill, sorry, learn this important skill, then they might remain financially dependent on us. And as I work with clients, especially the older one, many of them are concerned if something happened to me today, I'm still supporting my child to a certain extent, what will happen to them? And that remains a concern. So it's important that at whatever stage you are in, if you're young, very good. If you're well advanced in years, it's still okay. It's never too late to learn the most important things that you need to learn about managing finances. So if I was to give my first observation, my first tip about managing your money, it would be that it is very, very important that we, be, we, we, we gain knowledge or we become learners of our own self. We become self-aware. Um, I can see recording has paused. Let me start it again. Yeah, so it's very, very important that we become self-aware. And why is this? I don't know if you can, if you're many in your family, you can observe the people in your family and notice that even though you all come from the same parent, 
you are you are all very very different you all look at things very differently you've been raised by same parents same environment going to the same school eating the same food but you all tend to be very different and part of the reason is because god made us that way we are different he gave us different temperaments so there are various assessments you can do to know your uh, your, your temperaments but uh, for those who are here uh, tomorrow as we share the recording i will share one of the tests that you can do to get clarity on your temperaments so when i talk of temperaments i'm talking about um uh, you may have heard of cholerics you may have heard of melancholic um phlegmatics and sanguines and all these people we all tend to have this all all those aspects but one of those temperaments tend to be more dominating than the other if I may give my temperament, I give my secrets away, I am a choleric. So I tend to be very action oriented. I tend to be very, um, I mean, very, I want to move very fast, very decisive, and I want to move very fast. So if I need to make a financial decision, I'll look at what I need to do, and chances are I'll make a decision very, very quickly. Sometimes that's a good thing, sometimes that's not a good thing. It is not a good thing when I don't take all the necessary time to look at the things, for example, at what could go wrong. I may make a decision too soon. But we also have people who, the phlegmatics, for example, they tend to be to take their time. They are not in a hurry. And sometimes that will, will result into missing out on opportunities but on the good side, they could also take time to analyze everything they need to do and take the next step when they are ready. Now, self-awareness will help you know what your strengths are, and it will also help you know what your weaknesses are. So for example, sanguines tend to be very fun-loving people, and they tend to be very, very spontaneous. And one of the good thing about them is that many of them will work hard for their money and enjoy their money. But the downside of that is that sometimes because of their spontaneity, they don't plan well for the things that they want to do. So they will tend to focus more on the fun items and sometimes they struggle with the basics. So a sanguine might want to go on holiday when they don't have an emergency saving or they don't have money to pay rent for at the end of the month. But to them, fun is such a big thing. Now, there's nothing wrong with that person. They were created that way. And the, that temperament is not wrong. We just need to know who you are and then you manage your strengths and then, I mean, you, you, you capitalize on your strengths, but then you learn how to manage uh, your weaknesses. So each temperament has its strengths, each, each temperament has its weaknesses. We are not victims of our temperaments. We can't say, oh, uh, I'm a sanguine, there's nothing I can do about it. I'm a, I, I always do impulse buying. No, you can actually have tendencies to be an impulse um, spender, but you can choose not to do that. You can choose to actually plan your spending, have a budget and actually do that. Now, temperaments do not change. Our nature does not change, but we can develop the weak points. So it is important that we actually be on a self-discovery journey because we are, not in a, we are not in a sanitized environment. There are so many things that are changing around us. We get married, we marry people with different temperaments and uh, who they are rubs on us and we also start modifying ourselves. The environment is changing, our circumstances are changing. So you could actually find that you're actually moving in a certain direction. So know who you are, know your temperaments, know how they are likely to help you manage your money well or how they are likely to lead you into financial problems and then come up with uh, strategies. And I can share that at a later date when we can actually have a webinar to look at how temperaments affect our financial behavior. So that is one. And the next thing that we, we need to know is what our risk appetite is. Now, all of us are comfortable with a certain level of risk. There are people who enjoy high risks and there are people who do not enjoy high risk. And some of these risk appetite qualities are tied to our temperaments. So if you are a low risk person, chances are you'll miss out on investment opportunities that just require a certain, uh, just a slightly higher level of risk because we know return is usually the price for risk. So the low the risk, the low the return. So sometimes you tend to, to, to only invest in safe investments well, it, it would probably be okay if you just took a slightly risky investment. I'm not saying you go way outside of your comfort zone, but knowing your risk appetite will also enable you to go into investments that you are at peace with. 
because if if you're not sleeping at night because of an investment that you went into, you're probably in the wrong investment. So know your risk appetite and monitor it. Now, your risk appetite can actually improve. And we, we, we aspire that you grow in your risk appetite and you'll be able to accommodate more and more risks. And how does this happen? You can actually gain your confidence or grow in confidence as you practice. And I'm going to use that uh, analogy of a child learning to walk a lot. Now, when children start learning how to walk, they tend to be afraid to walk because when they take a step or when they, 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 they stop supporting themselves and they have to walk without support, they fall. And so a child can decide, I don't want to fall. So I'll never let go of my support. I'll always walk uh, while holding on to something. But what will happen is that they will not develop that ability to walk. So as parents, we let them walk away. We actually um, entice them out of the support that they are holding on to, to come towards us. And in the process, they fall. Sometimes they get hurt. But after they fall, we encourage them to stand up or we go and lift them up. But as they practice, they actually get to walk, they develop that skill. The same thing with, uh, with our risks. When you start learning about something, for example, there are many people who do not know, um, who have not invested in products like bonds or certain uh, types of insurances because they don't know them, they don't understand them. They've heard about them, but they don't know how they work and, and they will never know how they work until they have such a product. So one of the things I do with most of my clients, I encourage them to buy a bond, even if it's a minimum of 100,000 shillings. Because what will happen is that as they go through that process, they will learn how to, how to buy a bond. They will learn how bonds work. They will receive an interest. They'll see the government pays that money directly to your account and they gain confidence. And one of the outcome I have seen from many of my clients is that when we, we come up with a, a plan on the investments they need to go into, once we set up the first one, they never come back to me, uh, probably to top up or, or to upgrade because they have already gained the confidence by doing it. So it's very, very important with, with, with financial services that you learn these products because we have plenty of products that are very, very good, but majority of us are only utilizing a few. And part of it is because they have a very low risk appetite towards them because they don't understand them. So knowledge will increase your risk appetite and experience will also increase. But we have there on the other side, some people who by nature, they have very high appetites. And I know some of them. Um, so they, they are wired that way, God wired them that way. And these are very important people in our society because they're the ones who take a lot of risks, they set up businesses and they provide a lot of in, uh, employment opportunities. So it's good to have that appetite uh, for risk, but it's also important that even as you take more risks, because you're comfortable with risk, don't disregard the basic financial principles. So many business people or people with high risk, they'll not want to have some money, for example, in, a, in, in, a, in an emergency fund, in a money market account where it's only earning 8%. And because probably they have to put in a million or something like that, they feel like that money is just wasting away, like I could do more with that money. So many of them will be tempted to use that money and invest it where it's likely to grow by a very large percentage, but it also comes with a risk of loss. Now, you can grow that money but should you have an emergency at a point where that money is not available, let's say you've started a business. And so the business is still growing. It's not generating a lot of income. So if you have an emergency, then you'll be in financial stress. You'll be wondering, how do I meet my needs? Um, and, and you might actually end up in debt because if it's an emergency, it needs to be attended to, you'll have to do that. So whether you have a low, appetite, a low risk appetite or a high risk appetite, it's important always not to disregard the basic financial planning principles. And these are things like start with an emergency fund, diversify your investments amongst other things. And we'll see some of those things. So for, for, for those who like going straight to big investments, maybe the example I can give is you, if you choose to build a house, you can't say because um, I have a lot of money, I will start with building the walls. I'm building a net, but I'll start with the walls and then I'll finish with the foundation. You can't do that. Uh, you, you won't have a house, to, a foundation to build. The house will have collapsed. So the same thing with financial, uh, managing your money. You can't start with the most risky investment while you don't have the basics of things like emergency funds. So good thing that you have a good appetite, but 
Uh, it won't serve you well in the long run if you don't follow the principles. The last thing about self-awareness that I have come to realize is for those who are Christians, um, the struggles we go through when it comes to clarity and confidence are actually tied to, to, to what Jesus taught about money. And when you read the passage of Matthew 6, 19 to 20, I mean, 19 to end of the chapter, it's where Jesus says, um, do not lay your treasures here on earth, but lay them in heaven where moth and, I mean, they, they cannot be destroyed. And he also talks about us not worrying about what we eat or what we, uh, we wear, but focusing first on his kingdom. And, and when you read that part, I know many of us have read that part. It's, it's a very serious uh, thing about finances that really, really affects how we manage our finances. Most of us are very confused about money. And from my experience uh, or from my understanding, I have come to realize it's because there are no, when it comes to money, we are mainly dealing with moral issues. And there is no decision you make um, in finances that is neutral. You, you take a stand. And I want to quote from a book, um, a, a book I'm reading uh, by a pastor. He has written a book called Redeeming Money. And, and this is what he says when, when he, he references that Matthew 6, 19 to 22, this is what he says, which I agree, I agree with. Everyone lives for some kind of treasure. We all live to gain something. Our lives is about something. It's about a certain goal. It's about a certain value. It's about something. So there is some treasure we are, we are pursuing. There are some treasure we are hunting. So the question is, what is that treasure you are living towards? Then the other thing that comes from that passage also says that what is that thing that is your treasure, the thing that you value most will control your heart. Let me give an example. Some people want to have a very comfortable life. And I think it's most of us, we want comfort. Uh, we want a good standard of living. If that is your treasure, if that is what your life is all about, that will control your heart. And why is that a big thing? This is because your heart is the, it's in your heart that you, 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 you make convictions, you decide what you're going to do. You, you, you make convictions that actually guide your life. You make beliefs. And what you decide in your heart is actually what you do, not what you know. There's a difference between what you know and what you believe. Sometimes it's the same thing and we hope that you can reconcile those two, but sometimes your heart and your mind could be a different point. So for example, you know, taking too much debt is not good, but because you want a certain standard of living, you might still want uh, to take debt because you really want to have that standard of living. And so many people will end up doing what they don't believe in, I mean, what, um, what they know is wrong, but because that thing is going, is going to help them meet what they need, then they go ahead of it. So it's important to know what is my treasure, because where my treasure is, there my heart will be also. Uh, sometimes I used to feel like that verse should be the other way around, where your, money, where your treasure, where your heart is there, that's where your money is, but that's not true. Our heart follows the things that we value the most. So what is it that you value the most? And then the third thing he talks about there, he says, what controls your heart will control your words and your behavior. So the thing that controls your heart will eventually control what you say and what you do. So if what I value most, and if you look at our society today, many people value money. Um, it's like if you don't have money, uh, you're, you're not like everybody else. So what do people do? Most of the people's talk is about money and everything they are doing is basically to get that money. And no wonder we have very high levels of corruption in this country because what we value or what our treasure is or what people are mainly valuing is something to do with the standard of living and the kind of money that they have. So it would be very, very important to ask ourselves, what is that thing? What, what have I made my life all about? Because what you make your life all about is what you worship. So we know there are people who worship money. They don't need to tell us. We know there are people who worship money. So I want you to introspect and ask yourselves, 
what exactly is the treasure that my life is all about? What am I pursuing? Because that is what you are going to do. And that is will determine how you manage your money. Because there are two kingdoms we serve in this world. It's either your kingdom or God's kingdom. And if you read that passage of scripture, that is what it talks about. Seek first the kingdom of God and the rest shall be added unto us. But I think um, many people, uh, probably even us to an extent, we tend to pursue the, these things first. And I think there's uh, my friend recently uh, reminded me that uh, worldly wisdom is in, in many, many cases counter godly wisdom. So we have the Maslow hierarchy of needs that we normally study in school. And we are told we start with basic needs and then at the top, after we've met all the basic needs and all the needs that we have, it's at the top that we pursue a self-actualization and purpose and all that. But that's not what godly wisdom says. Godly wisdom says, first seek him and then all these things that then will be added unto us. So what kingdom are you serving? I think many of us who struggle, we struggle because we are in between two kingdoms. We want to serve God, but at the same time, we also to serve our own kingdoms. But it's important to know that Jesus said you can't serve both. So it's either God's kingdom or it is your kingdom. If you want to serve your own kingdom, you'll tend to follow the worldly uh, advice, what the world is doing, the people who are succeeding, what are they doing? That is what you'll follow. And some people appear like they are succeeding, but we know that is not the best way to go. But if you choose to pursue God's kingdom, then you will follow what he says that you need to do. Because in his word, he has given us everything we need to live a godly life. And that includes everything we need to manage our finances. So the scriptures give us everything we need. And if you follow that, if, you, if your treasure is to follow God or to bring God glory, then you will follow um, his ways and you'll manage money his ways. And if you manage money his ways, I, I, I can assure you that most of the confusion that we normally have will actually cease. Because with God, it is very, very clear. And if I may just mention some of those things, I normally summarize them in five principles. If you've, if, if you've had this before, please, um, I, I mean, allow me to say that for the sake of those who may not have joined my webinars before. So when you read scripture, it just gives five simple rules of managing money. And if you manage your money that way, you will succeed. So the first one is the, the principle of spend less than you earn. And that is basically what your parents told you and everyone around you told you. That's a biblical principle. And it's also a principle that is respected in the world. But my struggle with my, what I have observed is that many people don't tend to know much. I mean, they tend to lack important information about their finances. So this is a common question I ask people. How much do you earn? And I normally hear somebody ask me, gross or net? I just repeat the question, how much do you earn? Many people only know the amount of money that goes to their bank account, and they say that is what they earn. Yet that is not true. What you earn is what you negotiated with your employer. The amount that goes to tax is still part of your money, and there is room for you to manage that tax. Uh, the government gives us a lot of ways that we can actually reduce our tax liabilities by taking certain investments and insurance products and that way, if you don't consider that as your income, chances are you'll be paying the maximum tax that you can while you actually have an opportunity. So we are told to know, when you read Proverbs, it says, know the status of your flock, know the state of your flock. Uh, that was the wealth that the uh, people in olden times had. They had to count their flock. They knew how much, uh, how many goats they have, how many cattle we have. But sometimes we don't tend to know that. There are many people who don't keep tab of the income that they receive. And they are also not keeping a good tab of the expenses that they are spending. They don't know for sure how much they are spending. So know the status of your income. Look at your pay slip on a monthly basis. Um, look at your expenses. I'm not saying you track your expenses every day, though that is, I mean, uh, every month that is necessary from time to time. But it's good to just analyze and see how did we spend the money. For most of us who work, uh, most of the people in these webinars tend to be employees. Organizations have monthly budgets. They have annual budgets, which is broken down into monthly budgets. And at the end of every month, the accountants always compare how we have performed against what we projected and what we have done. We would do well to do that with our personal finances. Now, many people don't like hearing the word budget, but if you are going to obey this principle, you can't do it without a budget. 
And a budget is not something that restricts you. We need to look at budgets for what they are. A budget is just a plan of directing where your money will go. Because if you don't do it, someone else will direct it. That will either be the people who will call you for money or the advertisements. Um, the, the, the advertisements will direct you where to spend your money. So uh, look at a budget as just basically something that helps you manage your money according to your own priorities. So you need to know what matters most to you, both in the short term and in the long term. And then you say, I'll spend this amount of money on groceries, on, on, on rent, because eventually this is what I want to achieve. So a budget need not be a bad thing or something that makes you feel like you're restrained, you can't do what you want to do. So I would encourage you to, to, to especially in, in this season where prices are just going up, every time you go to buy bread, it's 60 bob, next time it's 65 bob, the last time I bought it was 70 bob. I mean, our expenses are really increasing. So once in a while, you can actually ensure that you, you track all your expenses for a whole month. Most of the expenses you receive bills for, you know how much rent you pay, you know how much probably electricity you pay, but they are, the lifestyle, the, the groceries and the, the, the life events that you normally pay for, those are the things that uh, may, may, may change from month to month, record them. And then once you get those figures, put them in specific categories like housing, uh, food, uh, children, uh, life events, savings, put them in major categories and then annualize those amounts you've 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 put down together a monthly um monthly amounts that you have spent but annualize them multiply them by 12 to see how much you'll spend on those things in a year there's something about looking at annual income that you're able to compare well and ask yourself is this the way i want to spend my money for the rest of the year and some people actually realize they would want to adjust some things and then you adjust that and then you try the new budget and you keep on doing that until you get a perfect fit or rather a comfortable fit. And, and then from every month, just review your incomes, review your expenses, make the necessary ad adjustments. And that will not take you a lot of time. That will take you five, 10, 15 minutes with, with, with time and with use of technology nowadays. That is something that you can even track along the way. There are good apps out there. So that is one thing that we need to do. I am not aware of any successful organization that succeeds without budgets. And I don't know why we sometimes think that as individuals or families, we can actually succeed without that. So it's important that we, we, we have those spending plans. Let's call them spending plans if we don't like the word budget. And let's use them on a monthly base, basis. Evaluate it at the beginning of the month and say, this is how I'm going to spend. And at the end of the month, look back and see this is what I spent. But even in between, uh, during the month, it's good to monitor where you are. Uh, depending on your temperaments, again, some people, they will set a budget and they will follow it. Some people, they will struggle to follow it. So if you're the kind that struggles, uh, use a means that works for you. Uh, for those who struggle, I encourage them to use envelopes. There's what we call the envelope system. Just put money for entertainment, for groceries, for whatever it is, withdraw that money and put it in envelopes. And when you're going to spend, remove money from the specific envelope and you'll get to see how far that is going. And then restrain yourself from borrowing from another category to fund something else. And so there, there are various things that you can use. And, um, and, and, and once you get one that works for you, stick to it. Stick to it. So that is one way of, uh, that is one thing that you can do that would help you to manage your money well. Another thing that you can do, another principle, if you choose to manage your money God's way, it's to create what we call liquidity. Now, financial stress is primarily a liquidity issue. We have organizations collapsing while they own huge buildings in this city. They don't collapse because they don't have assets. They collapse because they can't meet an obligation when it is due. So when you have an expense you need to take care of and you don't have money, it doesn't mean that you don't have assets. Most of us own cars, we own a lot of things in the house, we own pieces of land, but we are stressed. Financial stress is primarily a liquidity issue. So ensure that you maintain levels of liquidity that would help you take care of the unexpected because the unexpected will certainly happen. So whether you're an optimist or a pessimist, it really, really doesn't matter. 
the unexpected will happen. And for you to manage your money well, you need to be ready for those the unexpected things when they happen. So maintain an emergency fund. That is what building a liquidity means. If you're young and uh, you're, 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 you're employed, you can look at your monthly expenses and, and save three to six months worth of living expenses. Uh, the more senior you are and the more likely it is for you to take longer to find a similar job if you lost the one, the one that you have, the higher should your emergency fund be. And also, depending on the responsibilities that you have, if you have children in school, you're taking care of other dependents, you need to have a higher emergency fund. So someone who loses a job as a senior manager in an organization might take a lot longer to find a similar job that would pay the same compared to somebody who loses um, a low level job because there are, there are fewer opportunities in senior management. So you can estimate that uh, to be how many months will it take for me to get another job? And you can use that as a basis of the number of uh, months, uh, one month living expenses that you need to set aside. So if it will take me six months, then I need to put at least six months worth of living expenses, basically looking at the expenses I would have to pay if I lost a job and you do that. But even as you go about investing, one of the things that you need to do is to ensure that you're having a combination of liquid investments and non-liquid investments. So that should you need to liquidate or should you need uh, those finances, you'll be able to get that from your liquid assets. So we have a lot of people who own a lot of uh, assets, but we still do harambees for them when they need to go, to, maybe they need medical attention. And it's because they can't quickly liquidate what they have. So it's important that you maintain a balance. Yes, uh, liquid assets will not give you as much return as um, illiquid assets and long-term assets. Uh, liquid assets tend to have lower returns, but we need to realize that our lives are not just about the future. We have to live today. So we must take care of today. And tied to this, and especially for young people who are just about to start working um, it's, it's interesting, the observation I have made from most of my clients is that the first investment they made after they started earning, they bought a piece of land. Some bought as individuals, some bought as groups. Now, they, they, they didn't have a, an intention of developing that piece of land. So they were holding it for a number of years and hopefully sen sell it later so that they can uh, do something else. But it's not a near term, I mean, it's not a short term investment. Now, the problem with that is that should you have an urgent or a big need for your money, that particular investment will not be able to help you. It would be well for young people or for you, wherever you are, whatever stage you are, to start with uh, investment that give you passive income. You might not need that money, but you could save it. So some of these investments, there are things like bonds, there are things like... Um, um, Bonds will do will normally do very, very well. They are passive in the sense that you are not actively involved. So you'll be able to focus on your career and build your career as opposed to starting with a side hustle at that point and your attention is divided. And so you're not doing very well at work and you're not doing very well at business. So bonds will be low risk. Uh, you, can, you can invest in short-term bonds, but every six months that bond will be giving you some money. And in case you need to sell that bond, you can easily sell it within a week and you'll be able to get uh, money to attend to a need. Uh, you could also put some of your money in, in, in money market accounts that are easily accessible. And they're also giving you a good return of about, right now the returns are going between eight to 10%. So start with liquid investments. If you don't need the money, save it. And then later you can actually go into those investments. But when you start with illiquid investments and then you build a portfolio of illiquid investments, what happens is that those investments do not help you in the short term and you start struggling with liquidity. So if you're whatever stage you are in, if you are young, I would encourage you start with the money market, start with bonds. Yeah, there is noise about the government bonds. Uh, we are not saying you put all your money there, put some money there. Um, then later you can actually go into other areas. If you're whatever stage of investment you are in and you're not having liquid investments, you're going more into illiquid investments, you'll do well to actually have liquid investments so that you'll not become a burden to the other. We, we, when we talk about being a burden to the other, sometimes we just think about retirement, but sometimes we are burdens to each other because we have to have family contribute to certain things we could actually do or we could actually afford with our investment is only that they are not in the right place. 
Now, the next one I'm going to talk about is the controversial one, uh, the whole issue of debt. The worldly wisdom tells us use other people's money. But if you choose to manage your money God's way, scripture tells us to avoid debt. So you have to decide what is what do you value most or, or, or what is that that controls your heart? Is it what God says or what the world says? So in the world, you'll see people who are succeeding and they'll say, oh, I did this through debt. I did this through debt. And sometimes you might not be able to see what you can do with it to arrive at the same level where they are. Uh, but if you actually want to use worldly wisdom, uh, that is one direction. But if you choose to go God's way, you should avoid debt. So that will determine what you will do with your money. Will you use your money uh, into investments that are likely to help you go into debt or will you do otherwise? So one of the things, uh, while the first investment people make with money tends to be land, the first uh, savings product that people tend to go into is circle. Most people join SACO before they do. It's like the second thing after they open a bank account. And many things, many people have done many things through SACOs. So that's an observation. And what the SACO does is that it encourages you to save and then to take a loan, which will be multiples of your savings, and you do something else. But godly wisdom tells us you can actually save towards that, and you actually get to do it. So one of the things um, uh, our economies and when we when we listen to people who are respected in the financial world, they will talk about helping people access easy credit um, where you have less uh, conditions being required of you to take credit. But when you talk to insiders in those organizations, many of them will tell you that nothing much is going on there. They are really not doing uh, good business. Yeah, they're still lending people money and all that. But when you look at the impact that they are having, they feel that uh, probably they could do better. So the worldly wisdom will tell us, let's go where it will be easiest for us to get credit. So we, we, the banks will not give us loans. So we form circles that don't ask us a lot of questions. As long as you can prove you can pay your contributions, they don't ask what you're doing uh, with your money. So the advice I normally give people is this. If you want to borrow money and you want to do it in a wise way, actually go to the bank. Just go and tell them, I want to join your bank if you're not in that bank. And uh, before I join, this is what I want and this is, uh, I would want to borrow to take a loan from you. And if they give you that loan, then it's probably a good loan. If they say they cannot give you a loan, then I would encourage you not to take a loan from any other sources because the people in the banking sector are, are, are the experts in banking. They're the ones who know about credit. And if they don't think it's a good loan, they have their procedures to evaluate and see whether it's a good loan or not. So if they can't give you a loan, even if you take it from someone else, it doesn't make it a good loan. I know this might be countercultural, but the point that is the point. We tend to take a lot of loans that we shouldn't take or they're not good, um, good decisions. And while we may appear like we are doing well, we don't know the opportunity cost. If we chose to save that money and invest it, and then later do what we need to do, you'd still be able to do because depending on who is your master and what you really want, if you really want to please God, then you'll actually go ahead and do what God uh, asks you to do, even if it takes longer. Actually, God's way always tends to take longer. Uh, he always seems to do things slowly, but we know his ways are the best. So am I saying that you should not take debt at all? No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that there is some good debt and some of that debt is, a lot of the debts I, I, I know of are normally not good, but a reasonable mortgage will tend to be a good debt. And I'm using the word reasonable because we take a lot of mortgage, mortgage debts that are not good. So a reasonable mortgage is one that will be, you're, you're buying something that will serve your interest, not necessarily too much uh, loans that uh, will stop you from saving and investing towards other goals. So if you're in debt, then what happens? Because I could be talking to many people who are in debt. I would encourage you to plan to get out of debt as soon as possible. Always look at the money you're paying in terms of debt and know that the opportunity cost is to actually invest that money. When you pay off your debts, that money will be available for savings and investments. Now, how do you get out of debt? 
if you are in debt, sometimes the only thing we think about, and this is what I find with many of, of, of the people I have served, in most cases, we think of getting new money to pay our debts. We don't normally look at what we have and what we can use to pay our debts. Now, when we start saving, we always say, I'm saving for the future. But this future seems like it never comes because uh, we just acquire assets, we acquire, we acquire more assets, we, we have needs, we don't want to liquidate the assets that we have, but we just want to get more. So the question is, why were we doing these investments? What, what were they meant for? Was it meant to pass to the next generation? Or, or why are we not comfortable liquidating some of them and actually paying off our debts? So I would encourage you to consider, even before you look for money, is there an asset probably you need to liquidate and get out of debt. And if, if there is none, or if you have specific plans, maybe you bought a piece of land and you'd want to live there one day, probably you'd, you'll, you'll not be in a position to sell it. But what I would say is consider that all these things are meant to give you a lifestyle. And we tend to be very choosy when it comes to what we want to think. So when we are going into business, and especially business, we know the risk is high, we tend to be very optimistic. We know this business will do well, we'll get the best returns possible. And But most businesses don't turn out that way. But when we are going into, into savings and into other assets, we normally feel like I can always get a better price tomorrow, or let me just hold on to it for a while. Uh, it will serve me better in future. We don't think of what we have as if it can serve us well now. So sometimes we just end up um, put, getting more debt for things that we really do not need to, or not utilizing what God has already given us, and then later leaving it to people who might not be interested in it or who might squander it or use it within no time. So ultimately that investment does not serve us. So get out of debt. Start with a small debt, increase the repayment, use that repayment to, to pay for the next uh, smaller debts, and you keep on progressing like that until you finish the final debt. Mortgage, a reasonable mortgage, you can reduce your debt. You don't necessarily have to pay all of it, but we always encourage people to be out of debt way before they go into retirement. And then once you're out of debt, purpose to stay out of debt. Plan well. Um, and ask God for what you need. Sometimes we just go straight to borrowing. Well, probably if you ask God for it, he may not give it when you want it, but he could give it. And I've shared stories of how uh, my friend Janet was used by God to give me cuttings when all I wanted was cuttings. And that is what I prayed for. And I think we miss a lot of opportunities and we rob God an opportunity to serve us or to provide for us by taking matters into our own hands. So that is principle number three that we need to know. The next one is managing our money with a long-term perspective. Again, temperaments really play a big part in how we look at investments. The fun-loving people tend to look at today. They are like, let me live today. Nobody knows about tomorrow. Uh, the very money-conscious ones tend to save for the future, and they never they don't live today. So they, 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 they live a very... Um, strange lifestyle because they're saving for the future and then they never get to that future. They never get to use those resources and others fall in between there. Others are too cautious. Even when they have all the information they need to make investments, they don't make investments because they're, they're very afraid. While others, they just get lost in paralysis analysis. They'll want to do it, but they take too long and miss out on opportunities. So it's important to look at um, the whole picture not just today. Just look at, uh, I, am, I am here. God is likely to give me life. Uh, he hasn't promised me the number of days, but suppose I lived to 90. Um, how do I want to live my life? And then you start managing that. So for the younger people, I would want you to think of the value of saving 1,000 shillings today. We, I can buy my own pizza or I can go out with my friends and we share pizza and I use 500. And then I use the balance of 500 shillings and save it every month. And it will accumulate into huge amounts of money. Think 10, 20, 30 years. That 500 shillings per month or 500 shillings per week could make a very, very big difference. Uh, the other thing is you could be having money. You can take an Uber or you can take public transport uh, or you can choose not to go somewhere and save that money. 
And then that money will actually even give you a better experience in future. So don't just think about the value of 100 shillings today. Think about the value of that shilling in one year, two years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, when you're 70 years. And then you'll actually notice that, yeah, I need to use some of it today, but I actually need to put some of it so that that money will work for me. An illustration I keep giving in my webinars is if you save 3,500 shillings from when you're age 25, uh, and you just grow that contribution by 10 years, I mean, 10% for every year until you're age 60, and you get a return of about 10% across that period. In those years, you will have saved just about three or four million, about four million, but your money will have grown to about 20 million. And that is what we mean when we say money working for you. So you put in four million, but you actually get interest of about 80% uh, of your fund will be interest. So think long-term and uh, uh, apply your finances. So the other thing I've noticed um, when, when people are making investments, yes, and they are trying to think long-term, um, th there is this whole uh, issue of having side hustles. Now, side hustles are good. And it depends with whether you can actually do it. So for young people, uh, what, what I would like to tell people is that may, not everyone will succeed in business. And we know statistics about businesses. And I wouldn't want to discourage those who want to try businesses. But there's a right time for everything. So when you're young and you think you're likely to have a career, I would encourage you to focus more on your career. And while you need to invest, you don't have to invest in a side hustle. You can take that money and invest it in a passive income, something that won't take your time or energy from your work. So you'll be able to, to study for professional papers if you need to do that to advance your knowledge. You'll be able to put in uh, all your energies into your work. You'll be able to grow. And you can actually raise your money, not just from a side hustle, but from your career. Um, when I was starting out my career more than 22 years ago, I noticed that there, we all started almost at the same place, maybe not, a few companies paid a little bit more, but some people's career grew way faster than others. And sometimes when you look, you, you realize, oh, they actually invested in their careers. They, they went back to school, they had mentors, they, they, they traveled, so they were a little bit more exposed and they ended up increasing their income. Some people take the other route of having a career and having side hustles, and then they don't succeed at either. At work, it is very evident they're not giving their best, they're not stellar performers. So their income doesn't grow as fast. They don't get new responsibilities. But again, the side hustle, because it also doesn't have their full attention, they also tend not to do very well. So ultimately they lose on both ends. So it is very important to gain some level of clarity. And, and look at uh, what will this side hustle cost me? Because it's not just time, uh, it's energy. It might also take away some time that you'd be spending with your family uh, amongst other things. So look at the total cost of the investment that you're making before you go into it. So I'd encourage um, for those who it's time to go into businesses, well and good. But it would be helpful if you also build this passive income from an early age so that by the time you're transitioning into side hustles or into businesses, you already have sort of like a salary from your passive investments. And then you'll probably be even be able to do way better in, in business because your primary concern is not to pay your rent or your food because you already build a passive income. So there's nothing wrong with business. Some of us, many of us will end up in business and they'll create opportunities for other people. But you also see people who leave employment, go into business, they don't succeed because they had not prepared themselves for that life because with business, the income might not be predictable. And then finally, the other thing that for us to manage our money well is basically generosity. So there are five things the Bible tells us to do. Spend less than you earn, create liquidity or margin, uh, avoid use of debt, manage your finances with a long-term perspective. And the last one is generosity. And this has a lot to do with what is in your heart. Now, again, self-awareness comes in here. Uh, different personalities, financial personalities, tend to have... Um, tend to have certain qualities. So let me give an example of myself. My personality is a producer. Producers are people who like managing money. So they like investing, they like planning, they like all those budgets and everything. That's, that's how they were wired. They are not, there's nothing wrong with them. But they tend to struggle with giving. 
giving does not come naturally to them. But there's another personality called nurturers. And, and I'm saying this in reference to a certain test that I normally use my, with my clients. It's called moneytype.me. Uh, you can actually Google www.moneytype.me. You can do your test there. So the people who are nurturers, they just give. It's hard for them to enjoy their money while somebody they care about does not have the money. So while generosity is a good thing, for them, sometimes it ends up harming them because they give even what they don't have. They'll go into debt to support other people who probably would also be able to support themselves. So whether you're, it's easy for you to give or it is not, this is something that when you look at uh, what God instructs us to do, we actually need to do. Um, th there is a scripture, I'm sorry, it's just come to mind, I did, not, I did not put it, so I may not be able to quote it as well, but there's a verse in New Testament that talks about, uh, I think it's in the epistles, where Paul was saying, the, let the person who was stealing, stop stealing, but work with their own hands, so that, you'd expect Paul to say, so that they can provide for their needs, yeah, I'm sure that is implied, but what that scripture talks about is that, so that these people can give to those who are in need. So part of what God expects us to do with our money is actually to give towards those who are in need and towards the things that he needs done. So if you believe that God is the owner of the resources, then you believe that he has a say when it comes to generosity. And so it's not an issue of whether you feel like giving or you don't feel like giving. It's an issue of which kingdom are you serving? If you're serving your own kingdom, then you'll do your own things. But if you want to serve God, um, then you will contribute towards building his kingdom. And that will require that sometimes, we, I mean, not sometimes, but we will need to use our money to give. And some of the places it requires us to give is towards our church because the church um, is the, the structure that he has put in place to, to shepherd us, to nourish us, and to serve our needs. And the church also, many churches actually also serve the needs of the poor. So it's one of the areas we need to give into. But that's not the only area. We have relatives, we have friends, who need our help. But when you read scripture, and this is one thing I have actually come to realize, many of us give to our friends, not to people in need. Can our friends have money and be in need? Yes, that is true. But when you read a scripture, God talks about lending. Um, he who lends to the poor, lends to him. So God does not talk about lending to our friends the one that he really rewards, and I believe it's a good thing to give to our friends, but he really looks for us to serve the needs of those who are in need. So even as you give and, and as you look at the budget you're using on your giving, look at where are you giving? Are you serving your own kingdom? I normally say, especially the middle class, where I believe most are here, we create a social insurance. Um, because we are a group of 10, if you contribute 10,000 shillings when one of our friends has an issue, that's 100,000. So I know, uh, when I have an issue, I can count. I can actually say, no, I'll have 100,000. But what about those who really need the help? What are we doing towards them? Are we helping them or are we just focusing on other things? So it's important to look at what God is doing and join him in his mission, in what he is doing. But in addition to that, he has given us passions. Uh, we tend to be drawn to what specific things. Some people like helping children. Some people like helping street families. Some people like helping children, uh, bright children from needy families, whatever burden uh, or interest or passion that God has laid on your heart, it's important that you plan for it. Being generous involves planning the money to be generous with. You can be generous in speech, you can say you want to be generous, you want to give, but until you make that money available and you actually deploy it towards doing that, you're not generous, you, you just have the idea of generosity. So planning to give is important because uh, you need to give what you have. You'll not go into debt to give. But again, also, you can't give um, to the poor and not take care of your own, because that's also another command. So we have to read the whole council of scripture and apply all of it. So God, when you read, look at God, he's, he, everything about him is about generosity. He created us. That was out of generosity. We sinned. He, he created a plan for us to be redeemed. He called Abraham, who was not a God-fearing man, and, and, and he decided to start a race with him. And the people um, became a, a nation, Israel. They went into Egypt. He delivered them from there. All those are acts of generosity that eventually culminate in what Jesus did for us. So we are also called to, to, to be generous with our lives. What is it that you can do that will enable you to serve 
uh, God's interest because how you give will also show or will also be a testimony of which kingdom you serve with your generosity. So that is how we are called. Um, those, that is, if you want to, to, to manage your money God's way, that is how he tells us to manage. If you want to manage it your way, there is what the world will normally tell us. So I don't know if there are any questions so far. I'm almost winding up, um, but um, let me see. So there's one from Faith Mongai. She's saying, assume you want to buy land. The more you delay, the higher the land prices. Will this not lead? Uh, will this not lead to importance of getting a loan? And that's a very common question, a very noble question. And and I, I don't know if my client is here. There's one client I'm working with, and she's a perfect example of an answer to that question. She had mentioned she might not be here until now. So let, let me give her story. My clients, uh, when much younger, really wanted to live in Kilimani, but she could not afford Kilimani. So what did she do? She actually bought a piece of land wherever it is, I mean, a, a property wherever she could afford, somewhere else. And she did not, the, the, the dream of living in Kilimani did not die. Of course, probably property at that point, it was like 5 million. Later, as we speak today, my client lives in Kilimani, but she was able to buy that property at tens of millions. So what does it mean? She still ended up where she wanted. It was just a matter of time. God still provided what she liked or what she wanted. And I wish that uh, as young people or at whatever stage we are in, we can actually recognize that. When we ask that question, if I don't buy it now, the price will go up. You're making several assumptions. And one assumption you're making is that your income will not go up. <clears throat> On an extreme cases, you're also probably assuming God will not help you at that time. For whatever reason you've decided, God will not be there, will not be able to help you. So you'd rather sort yourself out. So, when God says avoid use of debt, he knows we need these things. He knows the prices will go up, but we also know that his, his, uh, his resources are not limited. So I would say you choose what, you, you, you'll be forced to choose what you want to do. Um, do I want to get this land because I want it now? And that sounds like I want to serve my kingdom. Then you will probably go and take debt. But you could also trust that God will give you what you want or what you need. And it might not be today. And like I said, he tends to come in a little bit later, but ultimately he might actually provide that. And it might not even take that long. Your income could increase uh, very fast and you're actually able to do that. So it's not always that the prices will increase and our income will never increase. It's also, our income is also likely to increase. The other thing is that sometimes we really like something, but with time, if we take a little bit of time, what happens is that our, our interests are uh, sort of tend to change. They are reordered, God reorder our steps. And we actually realize, oh, I actually would not even want to buy a piece of land there. There's actually a better place. So I would say, um, save towards that. You might not get that particular piece of property, but you could actually even get a better one. So it's not always that you will get a, a bad deal. So I can see there are more questions. Let me add, uh, talk on two and then I will go to the last part of this. What are the chances that the government at the rate they are moving may eventually be unable to pay interests due to investors? And then there's somebody who has asked me to summarize the five principles again. Um, Steffi, if you're here, you can do that. If not, I'll be able to do to, to summarize. Somebody says, I'm not able to get a bank loan because of the tenure of my contract. How do I get a good loan since I can't access the bank loan? Susan, uh, that's a genuine question, but the question is also, can you be able to do what you want to do without a loan? Because when you take a loan, basically, you still pay the same amount plus interest. So probably there are other ways you can use to actually get what you need without necessarily taking a loan. Because if you, if you do not have what the lenders are asking for, 
it appears to them that you are a very high risk, risk person and their recommendation to you is that you should not be taking a loan. So for, for you, I would actually encourage you to relook and say, how else can I achieve this goal without taking a loan? Because probably without uh, security of a job or that certainty that I have a job to pay uh, a loan, then how do you plan on paying that loan? And if you say that you have certain assets that you could use, then probably I would ask you, could you look into those assets today and see whether you can actually liquidate some and actually buy what you need to buy with the loan? Um, for Martha, is it possible that government can default? Yes, governments have defaulted in the past. Various governments, not many governments. I think the research I was doing recently, I found like five governments have, have um, defaulted in a way uh, as way back, I think, from 1900 to now. Part of those countries are Ukraine. Uh, they defaulted, I think, in 2015. I don't know if it's Botswana or Angola. We've had African countries that have um, defaulted. Some countries like Greece were about to default. But what normally happens, what has happened in the past is that, yes, the government may default, especially when they are going through very difficult circumstances. But the good thing about governments is that they are perpetual. They are not like companies that can die and completely die. So even if they are unable to pay, to repay their debts for some time, what tends to happen is that later when the fortunes improve, they are able to pay uh, the debts. I don't think among those uh, countries I, I read, I did not find any that eventually did not pay their debts. So what might happen is that there might be a delay in you getting your money, but most of them recover and they're able to pay the debts. So yes, that remains a risk. While we say bonds are low risk, we do not say that they do not carry any risk. They tend to be low risk because the government has, has more avenues of raising funds compared to anybody else or any other company. So for, uh, for Susan, let me summarize the five principles again. Uh, spend less than you earn. Um, create a margin or liquidity. Avoid use of debts. Um, set long-term goals, and finally, be generous with what God has given you. So if I was to summarize some of the things um, I have talked about, the one thing that I have noticed is that what we struggle with is that identity issue, whose kingdom are we serving? And when we try to serve both of them, we lack clarity and confidence. For those who are clear that they just want to serve God, it becomes very, very easy. And, and they apply his principles and they trust and they know that he will take care of them. And they have a guideline. I mean, they have the, the, the principles to guide their actions and they're able to move forward. So I would want you to think that uh, that's, 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 a, that's a place you still, have, everyone goes through. You have to make that decision. And the sooner you make the right decision, the better because it will make your your life much easier but as long as you're in between you will struggle because you want to please both of them but when you read that Matthew 6 what Jesus said is you cannot serve both you will have to serve one it is either your kingdom or his kingdom and I believe serving his kingdom is the best idea now once you make that decision that this is the kingdom that I want to serve then you need to be very clear with the vision so you know which master you're serving, but you also need to know what do I want with my finances? And while this might appear like it's easy, many people struggle with that. If you ask somebody, what do you want to achieve with your finances? What they tend to tell you is how they will achieve what they want. They'll tell you, I want to have land. I want to, to, to have a, a rental property. I want to have this. That is the means towards achieving a goal. That is not the goal. There's something you want to achieve, and it's important that each one of us defines that because the minute you define that, then it becomes easier to achieve it. So what are some of the things that we need to achieve with our finances? You can actually have a goal that I would want to be financially independent, or basically, I want to be able to sustain my lifestyle, whether I am working or not. So what does that mean? It means you need to, as you might need to work for some time, but as you work, you might need to set up certain investments that will give you an income that is probably equivalent to what you're earning in your current job so that even if you lose your job, you'd still be able to enjoy that standard of living. That is a goal that we all need to have. 
with that clear vision, then that will, will inform the activities you do, the investments you'll go into, and you'll find yourself avoiding certain investments at certain seasons of your life so that you're able to achieve that. So be clear about that. Think through. It's not, it's not very hard. It just takes a little bit of, of thinking and time to reflect and to decide and to observe, to talk to older people who have, who, who have a few decades ahead of you. There is no limit to learning. Even a 60-year-old person can learn from an 80-year-old person. And they'll tell you what will matter in that season of life. And then use that knowledge to actually create a plan for yourself. And then once you do that, don't put that plan in your head. That's what we normally say. We even put our budgets in our heads and we are not able to follow them. Please have a documented plan, just like our company would have a documented strategy and a budget. And the reason is not just to write it down, but to refer to it as you receive your income, as you spend your money, keep referring to it to ensure that you're spending, um, you're, you're spending as per your plan. Part of that plan will have to bring strategies that will enable you to achieve those goals. So it might mean if you are young, you need to go back to school so that you're more skilled, you're more attractive to employers, you get better jobs, better pay, and then you'll be able to achieve your goals. If your route is business, you might need to, again, equip yourself with certain skills that will enable you to succeed in business. If you're in your career, you'll know what you need to do to actually grow your income. So you must work your plan. So it's not just having a good plan. Many companies also have st good strategies. They never look at them. They never get to where they wanted to go. So document your plan and work your plan. And then life never goes as predicted. The unexpected again always happens. Stay the course. Do not deviate from your course. If the plan was well thought out, it should take care of those changes such that when they happen, you do not need to actually change from your plan. There might be a few adjustments because again, your interest might change. You might have had an interest to do something, but after certain, a number of years, you decide, no, I don't want to go in that direction. Your goals might change. Your goals might need modification. And then the investment strategy might be adjusted, but it will not be adjusted because of external factors, uh, because uh, the inflation have, has gone very high. We should expect that to happen. We should expect ups and downs in our economy, and that needs to be factored in your plan. So clarity of vision cannot be overemphasized. And that is what most of us don't have. Now, if you can't, sometimes we encourage people to, to seek help. There are people who can help you to create that vision. I work with individuals and families and we try to work out on that to make it clear. And uh, after I work with people, most of the things they normally say is that I, I have clarity on the next thing that I need to do and where I am going. And some of them say, no, I don't, it doesn't bother me what my friends are doing because I know what I'm trying to achieve and it is definitely different from what they want to achieve. So once you have clear vision, then the next thing you need to do is to gain the money management skills. Those things that are in that plan, you need to learn about them. So no one is casual about teaching their children how to walk because they know if this child doesn't walk, I'll have to carry them. No matter how heavy they weigh, I'll have to carry them around and nobody wants that. Why is it that we are so casual about learning this skill? We go to school to learn about money management, decision making and many other things. But many of us don't actually invest and I would call it an investment. You guys are investing your time today. You're doing well. But when we look at about the kind of investments, and today I was discussing with uh, a client and we were saying, when you buy a new phone or you are gifted a new phone, a brand, I mean, um, a brand you have never used, so it's not familiar, how long does it take you to use that phone well? We actually look and find time to study that phone such that within no time, we are able to call and to use the features that we want to use. Why is it that we don't do the same? We don't put the same kind of investment when it comes to managing money, yet this is one skill we'll need for the rest of our lives and the implications are so huge. The other thing is sometimes we know what we need to do, uh, the head knowledge, but we don't translate it into action. And sometimes we think the more money I get, I'll be able to manage it. No, it just magnifies those indisciplines and those uh, things that we have. If we don't have the knowledge, the skill, if you have more money, it doesn't mean you automatically get it. Remember I said the 23 year olds and the 80s, there are certain things they are very much alike because age, experience, education did not change that. So you have to 
learn. You have to develop yourself in that area. So look for information, set aside time, set aside resources, and you will be able to learn. Now, again, depending on what kind of a person you are, self-awareness, again, different people learn different ways. Find the one that works well for you. So if you are to learn, as I wind up, what do you learn? Because money management, um, just like any other course, it has elementary, it has intermediate, it has advanced. You can even become an expert and, 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 and do many things. There are certain things that you need to learn. The first one is how to cast a vision, how to plan for future, how to prepare for life transitions. That is one thing you need. Uh, and, and we do that by learning how to define outcomes. Short term, medium term, long term, all kind of, uh, uh, I mean, from short to long term, because you need to plan for all of them. You need to learn how to budget your money. I, I gave you some of the tips and, and there are ways that, the various ways that you can do it. I just picked one simple one. And that way you learn how to direct your money to work for you. We normally say, I want my money to work for me, but it is you to direct it to work for you. So you need to know how to do that. You need to learn and understand the investment products or opportunities that are there. We tend to be very aware of property. We tend to be very aware of businesses. But even when you make money in those avenues, you still have to save it or preserve it or grow it in other financial services instruments. Now, many of us do not understand them. So you need to learn about them. And this is my encouragement. Just take one. Start with money market if you don't know how they work. Spend some time in it. That could be 30 days. If you spend 30 minutes every day learning something about money market and practicing it, by the end of 30 days, you'll have learned all about money markets in the world because there isn't so much to learn. It's a very simple and basic product, but many of us don't understand it. Then move on to the next product. And as I'll be sharing later, I have, I have come up with something that you can actually follow and, and say, this month I will do this, next month I'll learn about this product, next month I'll learn about another product. And it's not just learning, it's learning and, and practicing. So it might, you might need to look for money to learn how to invest in stocks. You learn how to open a CDS account. You learn how to apply for the stocks that you want. And you even buy stocks and then even sometimes just sell so that you see how that transaction goes. Then you'll be uh, gaining skills. Then once you know how these products work, how these markets work, you need to monitor progress. Uh, every month or depending on what kind of investment, some investments we don't recommend that you look at them every month like stocks because they can go in all directions. Um, look at the returns. What returns are you getting? Uh, some are monthly, some are annual, some are other frequencies. Embrace, I mean, learn about the regulation. Like now we are all on tenterhooks because of the finance bill, uh, because it is doing very many things that affect us. But all finance bills normally have things that affect us. But for some reason this time, I think we are very, very keen on it. So many regulations pass um, every year that affect either taxation or products or how we do business. It's important to be informed so that even when new things that come up that you could take advantage of, you are, uh, you are informed. And then if you should be having a financial plan, learn how to, 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 to work on your financial plan and learn how to review your financial plan especially as circumstances change. Maybe you're single, you'll get married, what do you need to change? Uh, you'll have children, now you have a family, your income might change, the, the, the way you earn your income might change, maybe on a salary, then bonuses start coming. You need to actually uh, monitor all those things and see how they're affecting your plan. And then as you learn all those things and you have goals and you make the money, learn how to use the money for the intended purpose. So you wanted to save money so that you can travel. When you get the money, actually do that. Do, do, do what you planned to do. Otherwise, the plan does not actually have a purpose. So it's important then that we use our time wisely. It's important that um, you remember the four quadrants of um, Steve Harvey, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Sometimes we tend to focus on the things that are not important and not urgent, like how much time do we spend on social media? You can still spend time on social media, but learning something that will help you develop this skill. 
but we tend to focus on the urgent. If you have a deadline at work, somehow you'll do it, and that is important. It's important and it's urgent, and we do it. But what we need to focus on now, things like planning, the financial planning, personal growth, self-care, relationships, these are things that they're never urgent. In most cases, they are not urgent, but they're very, very important, but they don't shout. Your marriage will not shout, but the time it's shouting, it's in a crisis, it needs to move to important and urgent. So many of these things that we need to do are in the focus uh, quadrant, the one that is not urgent, but important, because if we don't take care of it, eventually it will become a crisis. I would encourage you to set aside time to actually learn. And on that note, I am happy to inform that um, having worked with clients, I actually realized that um, in 2021, I wrote a book for retirement planning and I realized the young people do not want to read it because they are not able to relate with retirement. Some of them have not even started working and they are wondering, okay, uh, so how am I planning retirement? Well, I haven't even started working. But so that uh, uh, led me to write a book uh, which I am showing here. I hope you can see it. I will project it in a meeting in a minute. And what I sought to do in this book is basically to help anyone, those who are leaving school and going into the job market, I've called it before you earn your first income, money management skills, you should know before you graduate. Basically the things everybody should know before they graduate. So before you graduate, if you have these basics and you learn them, all the things I've talked about are in this book. Then you will have a good start and you'll know what to learn and you'll start practicing them. But also, if you didn't learn this, and this is probably majority of us, we did not learn this in school. We did not learn it anywhere. We are learning as we go. It would be good to look at this book and see what should you have done. And in view of that, what can you do? So I have tried to use the, the simplest language I can uh, we know many people normally say that one of the reasons they don't um, they don't learn about finances is because of the jargon that is normally used. Uh, so I have tried to use English, and so um, it is simple to understand, and you you should be able to actually take the next steps. So I just want to project uh, that book. That is the book. It 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 is now available. You can actually order uh, if you want to have one before we launch it. Uh, the uh, the pre-order price or before launch price is 800 shillings, but after it is launched, we'll actually be selling at a, a thousand shillings. So I would encourage you that um, for those who probably uh, feel that I don't have the basics, I would really want to learn, please take this book. It's a book you can study even as a family where you have parents and young adults who are in school and who are preparing to join the job market and you will learn together. And as a parent, we know that even if your child is learning, chances are you're the one who will give them the opportunity to practice what they learn. For example, if they learn about money markets and they realize I can actually have a money market fund with, I can start with 500 shillings. Many young adults can afford 500 shillings, even those who are in school but they don't know how to go about it. You might be the one to help them identify a suitable company or identify uh, a financial advisor or planner who can help them set it up and they actually do it. If your kids are much younger and they have some money and they probably would need to set up a, a savings account, it is you to work with them to the bank and set up that account. So as a parent, we, 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 we will have a very important role in educating our children. So it would be good if you have a common basis uh, from which you can apply even as they apply. So I would encourage you to do this. And most of what I've written here has actually been informed by my experience of my clients, what I have learned with my clients. And I just want to thank them very, very much for giving me the opportunity to actually interact with them. So uh, you can pre-order, you can order through those details, but going forward, I will seek to uh, expound a little bit more on what I have covered in this book. So the next webinars that will follow will basically be going a little bit more. I would encourage you if you have a young person, encourage them to attend the webinars or send them the link when you attend and, and let them learn what they can learn. But you can also buy them as a gift. Um, their birthdays are coming up, some are graduating. 
some uh, you, you, you can buy them books and they, you can encourage them to study together, whatever it is. If you are a HR in an organization, I have a limited window of one month. Uh, you don't have to be a HR. Maybe you can go and convince your HR within the month of July, I'm willing to do free talks on uh, basics of money management. Uh, and I'll borrow a lot from this book. I will do those talks for free, one hour talk. So if you'd be interested, then uh, you, we can lie us and then try and schedule that. But uh, basically that is what I had uh, for you. Uh, for those who are approaching retirement or those who have not read this book, we still have it. You can buy it directly from me or you can actually buy it from some of the stores. Uh, you can find it at Nuria stores and you can find it at Fontana Bookshop as well as um, kibangabooks.com. So for now, uh, this book just came out yesterday, so it is not in any bookshops, but it will be by next week. So if you want a copy, you can order directly from us. And uh, if not, then uh, we will be able to have it in the bookshops in the nearby, in the near future. So that's what I have for from my end. I hope you have learned something. And the one, the parting shot for me today would be your greatest enemy to learn or to apply what you learn will be the busyness. You know, nowadays we are very, very busy. We are always running from one thing to the other. I would encourage you to put your oxygen mask first before you put it on your employer, because that's what we tend to do. We put our oxygen masks on our employers first before we put it on ourselves. Use your best time. If you are a morning person and morning is your best time, wake up 20 minutes earlier read a little bit for 30 minutes, equip yourself even before you go and serve your employer. Your employer some, does not demand most of what you give. And uh, they will be surprised that you're actually using that time to do that and neglect your own needs. Yet they are paying you for the services that you're offering. And when that time for you uh, comes for you to leave, they will have to separate from you. So let us be, um, let us not be too busy to do what will actually serve us the most. And I think that's what I have for today. If we have any questions or comments, I would be happy to take them. So for those who would want to engage with me, I think you've seen my number but I can type it again. Uh, you can reach me on that number. Uh, Sonia was asking about for Lisa and Tala. Uh, those are basically debts, um, um, very expensive debts. So before you take for Lisa or before you take that, Tala, it's important to find out uh, why, why am I doing this? Uh, can this wait? Can I save for it and take care of it? If it is a real emergency, is this the only way I can meet this need? And sometimes, like I said, uh, sometimes we don't even ask God to provide. And when we ask him to provide, we give him a timeline. We tell him, I need it and I need it now. Uh, but like I gave an example, uh, I prayed for cuttings. A few weeks later, my friend Janet sent me cuttings. That's what I had asked God for. Uh, before you fulliza, ask God to provide. And I know there are many people here who can attest uh, to God miraculously providing for their needs. But sometimes you will have a real emergency. You have a patient who is supposed to be admitted but the hospital will not give them any care until you pay a deposit. If it gets to that, I believe you can take debt, but it, debt should not be a solution for everything that you need and you don't have cash for. Most of the needs that we have, we can actually plan for. So somebody has said they wish to order my new book uh, for my daughter. Yes, you have given you my details. You can actually order through that uh, number. You can text me, I'll provide the details and then we'll arrange how you get it. How do you reach me? Uh, I've typed my number and uh, for now I'm, um, I operate from Vienna Court. We will be sharing those details as we share the recording. We will give you the physical address of where I am. So if there's no more question, I would want to end there. And I would want to ask someone to pray for us. Dave, would you want to close for us?
Uh, yes, uh, it's uh, it's okay. Uh, and thank you so much again for this session. It was very insightful. Uh, thanks to all who have joined. Let's pray. Uh, Father, we are grateful for this wonderful chance to get to know how best to steward the resources you've given us. Lord, we are reminded that uh, all things that we have is because of you. And we desire to grow and as a reason why pretty much we are all here to learn more, to learn how best to avoid certain mistakes and to become wise in our stewarding the resources we have. And uh, we desire this for ourselves and for our friends, our families. So Lord, we pray that as we have heard that we may apply it and you may grant us wisdom to in different scenarios, situations, that we may be wise uh, with managing our money, our resources. Um, thank you for, you have also guided us through scripture and we're also grateful for the work that you're doing in and through Rose in uh, educating us and enlightening us through these sessions. As we move out from this group and into uh, the the week as it winds down and even with our lives, you help us, Lord, to equally share this, uh, the knowledge that we've acquired through these sessions with other people who may not have joined us, uh, that we may all benefit for your glory and for our good and joy. Bless each and every person. Um, and we thank you also in, uh, for Rose. Thank you for the new book that she has written as we hope to uh, delve into it. May it also reach many people, especially the young, uh, that they may not be led astray, um, that they may be wise as a good stewards. Thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.